quite evidently, the state is more afraid of militant groups than nonviolent groups. The state understands that it has to react more forcefully and energetically to neutralize militant revolutionary movements. True, the path to revolution envisioned is much more dangerous and difficult than the one envisioned by pacifists. But it also has the advantage of being realistic. Pacifists roasted. <laughs> Hello everyone, Trey Misanthrope here, advocating for nothing more than peace and prosperity, and that's it. I promise. In light of the past, well, forever, many people are starting to question whether the old narrative of voting is worth its weight in salt. There is no doubt that you are afraid, angry, and feeling hopeless. And this hopelessness is starting to press down upon you, crushing you with fear. Climate disasters, attacks on trans rights, the overturning of Roe v. Wade, housing crisis, the existential dread of never being able to achieve the real American dream. It could be a bit much. And without much guidance from our elected officials, we might not know exactly where to turn. Well, I got one solution. Direct action. There are, of course, multiple forms of direct action. Volunteering at a food bank, community cleanup, marching in solidarity, providing clothing to the unhoused or underprivileged, raising money to pay for school lunch debt, the list goes on and all are equally important. And then there are protests where you can wave signs, sing loudly, and proclaim your support for a cause, any cause that might bring forth progress in civilization. Most of the time, these protests are free of controversy and stay nonviolent. And it is here where many will stay. And the fact that peaceful protest and pacifism works is, in fact, alluring. So much so that it has often been credited for many key victories in the civil rights movement. As Richard Cohen of the Southern Poverty Law Center states, The violence was being perpetrated by the oppressors, not the oppressed. And that was an incredibly powerful message and an incredibly important tool during the movement. Indeed, even before that, nonviolent action has been praised by many, from scholars to activists to poets. Following the Peterloo Massacre of 1819, Percy Shelley was so inspired by the nonviolent activism of the 60 to 80,000 peaceful protesters that he penned the poem The Mask of Anarchy, which is also a sick name for a punk doom band. Please, someone get on it. Though, okay... What was that thing I said earlier? The Peterloo Massacre? Wait, what? Well, to dive into history a bit, the Peterloo Massacre was a mass protest in 1819 brought about by a wave of unemployment, famine, and a high cost of living. Hmm, sounds like a familiar situation. As stated earlier, it drew somewhere between 60 to 80,000 people, and they were committed to peaceful action, so much so that the organizers forbade weapons of any sort, even defensive ones. They stay true and vigilant to this cause throughout the entire protest, and their uplifting spirit was met with armed resistance as cavalry charged them with swords drawn, killing 15 and wounding up to 700 people, the government cracking down on reform and arresting political opponents, and passed the Six Acts, which suppressed radical meetings and publications. <laughs> well, I guess the organizers really had egg on their face. But, okay, what about the civil rights movements, led by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. right here in the U.S.? Isn't that a huge victory in and of itself? There were peaceful protests, civil disobedience, pacifist marches. It was inspiring to the whole nation, even as high up as the executive level. So surely, after all that, it was through peace that we were able to get the Civil Rights Act passed, right? Well, the Baptist Minister King was one of the biggest targets of J. Edgar Hoover's FBI COINTELPRO, along with several key figures in the Black Movement Party, and he even received threatening letters from them, in which he felt were targeted attempts to make him commit suicide. Holy shit! And he was eventually assassinated in 1968. Some classes, my own included, like to pretend that his actions and later the assassination tugged at so many heartstrings that they just had to pass legislation to honor his memory. 
But as we'll see a little later, spoiler alert, this isn't really the case. Now, not all nonviolent protests ended in bloodshed. The Catholic Association's protests of the 19th century, led by Irish Roman Catholic practitioners, were successful in the passage of the Catholic Relief Bill. The ending of slavery in Trinidad was fast-tracked due to people chanting, no six years, not at all six years, loudly, at the governor, who they kept drowning him out as he tried to speak. The actual term boycott comes from a non-violent shunning of land agent Charles Boycott in Ireland, who attempted to evict nearly 11 farmers from their lands during a time of economic hardship, which inspired many to do the same all throughout Ireland and led to actual reforms being passed. Although, if I may interject, an argument can be made that the isolation and shunning the farmers did is a form of existential violence in and of itself. But then we have the Cherokee refusal to be removed, which led to the infamous Trail of Tears. Bloody Sunday, where Imperial Guards fired on unarmed demonstrators in Russia. The White Rose and Confessional Church did little to stop the Holocaust and the genocide of millions of Jewish, Roma, disabled, gay, and otherwise undesirable people. For every true victory of nonviolence, there are piles of bodies and failures. A side note, the next section about the victories of violent resistance was actually a perfect case example of media suppression. So when I was trying to Google the term violent resistance, it instead produced a fuck ton of results for nonviolent resistance, as if it was trying to steer me away from knowledge that I could potentially use. Now, I was able to get around this, but if you ever want to know why your results aren't showing up the way it is, Look at this case. In another video later on, I'm probably going to end up doing a whole thing on how to Google good. That one was inspired by my good friend Noam Bergman. So check out their channel below. So if nonviolence is such a failure, how else are people historically winning these movements? Well, I'll give you a hint. It's through violence. See, that was a joke. I told you I'd give you a hint, but I just gave you the answer instead. Please donate to my Ko-Fi. I'm clever. I'm funny. One of the most famously peace-washed incidents in human history is the Vietnam War. The U.S. military invasion of Vietnam was an attempt to overthrow Ho Chi Minh's communist North Vietnam, and it ended up being one of the biggest bloodbaths for U.S. soldiers relative to the amount sent over. And while a good number of peaceful protests in the states took place, they often ended up with police removal, usually violent police removal, or, in the case of Kent State, murdering of unarmed peaceful protesters. For the deployed personnel's part, they were famously disillusioned, with desertions quadrupling from the previous decade, fake radio coordinates and reports, and the scariest crime of all, partaking of the devil's lettuce. And sure, all these things combined had an effect on the unpopularity of the Vietnam War. But there was still such a strong anti-communist sentiment that if this was the only thing we had going on, we'd probably still be trying and failing to defeat the guerrilla warriors overseas. However, they didn't stop there. Hundreds of instances of fragging occurred during the actual war itself, which means tossing a frag grenade into sleeping areas to kill or harm fellow soldiers. And these were usually directed at units leaders or officers or decommissioned officers and the like. On top of that, domestic unease was at an all-time high and led to clashes with police and military recruiters. Some of the most impactful instances, however, came from a series of college campus bombings in which several college campuses that protesters saw as complicit in the war were firebombed, with the largest and most devastating one being the UW-Madison Sterling Hall, in which a group of activists known as the New Year's Gang attempted to take out the Army Math Research Center and killed physics researcher Robert Fastnot in the resulting attack. All these culminated along with a general unrest across the nation and amongst the deployed that the U.S. officially pulled out of the Vietnam War, and they learned their lesson and never tried to interfere again. The previously mentioned assassination of Dr. King may have been the first step towards fast-tracking civil rights laws. 
However, in reality, it was general strikes, riots, clashing with police, subsequent assassinations of key Black Panther figures like Malcolm X, and economic destruction that led to the official passing of the 1968 Civil Rights Act. As Black Power activist Stokely Carmichael, also known as Kwame Tour, put it, White America killed Dr. King last night. She made it a whole lot easier for a whole lot of black people today. There no longer needs to be intellectual discussions. Black people know that they have to get guns. White America will live to cry that she killed Dr. King last night. It would have been better if she had killed Rat Brown or Stokely Carmichael, but when she killed Dr. King, she lost. It was militant, violent direct action that eventually got results. Stricken with grief and rage, black people in America struck back at the people who were oppressing them. And even though some individuals argued that doing so would soil the hard work Dr. King put in, we must understand that Dr. King was not opposed to violence entirely. Much like fellow black rights activists, the Black Panthers, King believed in defensive violence. His house at one point being described as an arsenal. The Black Panthers, for their part, were intrinsically linked to helping build the black community up, getting them fed, educated, and armed, and their philosophies can still be found in many black nationalist and POC liberation activists today. Most recently, the wave of Black Lives Matter protests, while overall peaceful, have included many incidents of rioting and property destruction, with clashes usually started by the police culminating in bloody unrest and in at least one case, the burning down of an actual police precinct, which is fucking based in Minecraft. And not for nothing. Many U.S. states and counties have been listening to the increasing unrest, and charges have been brought upon many of the cops who participated in these shootings and killings. Certain chokeholds have been banned in 62 of the largest 100 counties in the U.S. after the death of George Floyd. Kentucky passed Breonna's Law, which banned the type of no-knock warrants that led to the death of Breonna Taylor. Confederate monuments have been torn down. And while racism is still a persistent issue and should always be challenged as long as the systems that perpetuate it exist, American white supremacy is being forced out into the open and more people are starting to see it. With continued pressure, we can work at shaking the entire fascist pillar at its core. Now, that isn't to say that violence always works. The most famous example is the 1992 LA riots, which saw mass lootings, beatings, and destruction of property after it was revealed that four officers who beat Rodney King for 15 minutes on video were found not guilty. This was coupled with years of tension between the citizens and police, a drug epidemic, and vast unemployment. Thousands of white and Korean-owned businesses were damaged, 63 people were killed, over 2,000 more injured, and over a billion in property damage. In the end, the only semi-victory that came from these riots was the notice that black America was under attack and was frustrated with years of racial inequality and ambivalence from white progressives. But as we see today, this is still an issue. The riots were criticized from people all across the political spectrum such as President Bill Clinton, Vice President Dan Quayle, and Ron Paul's own newsletter, who of course, given his long history with being a racist conspiracy theorist, stated that order was only restored in LA when it came time for the blacks to pick up their welfare checks three days after rioting began. What if the checks had never arrived? No doubt the blacks would have fully privatized the welfare state through continued looting, but they were paid off and the violence subsided. God, that fucking guy was evil. So... What makes revolutions work? I know I've targeted nonviolence as particularly ineffective in many cases, but that would be inaccurate as a whole. Rather, a diverse Rather, a diversity of tactics are necessary for any sort of social movement to truly succeed. Now while I don't ever think violence should be a good thing, you know, because that's against the law, it has been shown that if nonviolent action alone proves to be ineffective, Targeted, organized strikes against tactical targets help bring attention to the root causes of the movement. An organizer cannot rely on just pacifism alone, but rather must embrace both the peaceful actors and the militants in order to successfully persuade the political power structure and fast-track even the slightest bit of change. Of course, I'm only speaking historically and educationally, and never approve of such tactics myself, you know? Legally speaking. Uh, 
And you're gone. Thank you everyone so much for checking out this video. Since I've been slowly trying to rebuild my channel into having higher quality content, I figured my first new wave of the channel should probably be about something that I have discussed with many people over the course of the past year. And I really hope you all enjoy it. Special thanks to Chill Goblin, That Dang Dad, and Mo Black for providing their voices to this video. Please check out their channels in the description below. Please like and leave a comment if you enjoyed this video or my cat, and subscribe if you want to see more content like this. The Mayhem Calling Podcast is available on YouTube, Podbean, Spotify, iHeartRadio, and Audible. You can follow me on Twitter at TreyMissAnthrope or on Facebook at The Mayhem Calling Podcast. I have a Discord link below that's kind of dead right now, but can be brought back with the same kind of magic that brings Tinkerbell back from injury. Your emotional support. If you like the ending track, this song and more can be found at my Bandcamp, trevormisanthrope.bandcamp.com. And if you want to help financially support the channel, consider sending a monthly donation to my Ko-Fi at ko-fi.com slash themayhemcalling. And as a personal note, I know that we are worried about the future. The people in charge are working very hard to create division amongst the working class, and they are trying to take away our rights. We must overcome. Remember, we outnumber them. And we have a very powerful voice when used together. And as always, have a good night.